So for the next hour, we're going to be talking about femtocells. A femtocell is a low-cost, low-power consumer product designed to increase cellular signal coverage. It's basically a miniature cell tower. It is also a Linux box, and if you hack it, you can intercept the phone calls, text messages, and web surfing of nearly anyone within range. We're not going to talk about Prism. We're not going to talk about Snowden and any of that political stuff. This presentation is going to focus on the technical facts. Well, mostly technical facts. There's been many conversations over the last few days, and after lengthy discussions, Verizon has asked us to include these bullets. All right, and moving on. Before we go too much further, uh, a quick note on handset pairing. Your phone will associate to a femtocell automatically and without your knowledge. This is not like joining a Wi-Fi network. You don't have a choice. In fact, there may be some members of the audience connected to our network right now. Those signs out front are not just for show. You might want to put your phone in airplane mode. One more thing. This research has everything to do with the tower and very little to do with the actual phone. We don't break or alter anything on the actual handset, at least not yet. We also want to clearly state that the vendor has addressed the vulnerabilities that we use to get root on this device. We originally disclosed to the vendor about eight months ago and they worked very quickly to release a patch. It bears mentioning that the security issues we will be discussing apply to more than just one carrier. As you all know, nothing is 100% secure and we do have some architectural concerns with femtocells. And this should be no surprise to you, but we're not the first people to have these concerns. So, as you can see, Researchers have been popping femtocells since at least 2010. The latest example was right here in Las Vegas in 2011, where a group of hackers owned the crap out of a femtocell from a French carrier. Prior to them, the hacker's choice picked on a Vodafone box. Also, we want to mention up front that RSAX VC and Doug Kelly and their teardown hacking of the same model femtocell was very helpful to us during our earlier testing. As it turns out, someone looked at these things and didn't immediately think, let's use this for evil. A team from LMG Security will be presenting a talk using the same model femtocell as a cellular IDS tomorrow at 10.15. So we're going to cover some similar topics, but on a carrier that affects one in three Americans. To the best of our knowledge, no one has publicly presented an attack on a femtocell on a North American carrier. If you haven't figured it out yet, we're talking about Verizon. By the numbers, we're talking roughly 300 million people in the U.S., roughly 100 million Verizon subscribers. I'm really not that good at, good at math, but if my calculations are correct, that's about a third of the country. We will hopefully demonstrate how we can record and listen to phone calls, text messages, picture messages, and data. We even perform active man-in-the-middle attacks on data connections, as well as SSL stripping. And if that weren't enough, we throw in some cloning fraud for good measure. So to break it down even further, we're going to discuss how we obtained access to the femtocell, what we did once we got on it, the custom code we wrote to get the traffic we wanted, and our thoughts on fixing these things. For those of you that may not be familiar with the femtocell architecture, here's a high-level diagram. Your phone connects to the femtocell over cellular radio, in this case CDMA. The femtocell uses a broadband internet connection to create an IPsec tunnel back to the carrier's internal network. Verizon has two models of consumer-grade femtocells the SCS26UC4 and the SCS2U01. The UC4 was released in early 2009 and only supports three simultaneous users at 1x speeds. The 2U01 was released in late 2010 and supports six simultaneous users at 3G speeds. We were able to route both of these devices, but we created most of our proof of concept code on the 2U01 because it's newer, faster, and better looking. As we were doing some high-level due diligence, we discovered that Sprint has a femtocell too. As it turns out, both Verizon models and one Sprint model are made by the same manufacturer, Samsung. We really didn't have a whole lot of time to do that much testing on it, but the Sprint femtocell on the left is very similar to the UC4 and is vulnerable to similar attacks. However, we are told that Sprint is end of lifing this model of femtocell next month and replacing it with a newer model. We took a quick look at this newer model and we can say it's not vulnerable to the same exact attacks. So let's talk about the femtocell we spent most of our time on. 
The 2201 has an ARM processor, one NAND flash memory, and a lattice FPGA that we presume is for digital signal processing. Externally, it's got a GPS antenna, a CDMA antenna, as well as Ethernet and HDMI ports. I know what you're thinking. Did he just say HDMI port? Yes, I did. So it's a little tough to make out in this picture, but on the bottom of the device, hidden under a rubber plug, is an HDMI port. So we knew it couldn't possibly be used for video I.O., so we figured it's got to be a console port, and we were right. Why HDMI? I, well, we don't really know, but I do know that Samsung makes a lot of TVs. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you connect to an HDMI console port? Well, you take an HDMI cable, you cut it in half, you stick it on a USB FTDI cable, and you use a company branded pen to protect the connection because you're not really that good at soldering. <laughs> but <laughs> we really have to thank RSAXVC and Doug Kelly for figuring this one out. I'd like to talk briefly about the range of this thing since it's a question we get quite a bit. Um, the device's documentation states that a phone must be within 15 feet to register to the Femdo cell and it must stay within approximately 40 feet to stay connected. But in reality, it depends. Uh, your phone will connect to the tower that has the strongest signal. So if you're in an area with very good cell coverage, the real towers tend to drown out the femto cell signal. We think there's some tweaking that can be done in the software to boost the signal, but probably the easiest thing to do is buy a big ass amplified antenna. Of course, if you're in an area where you actually need this thing, we imagine the capture range will be pretty good. We did purchase an aftermarket directional antenna, mostly because we want to minimize the number of phones that we capture, and this antenna creates a nice tight signal. All right, uh, one last mention of the older model Femto cell. On the UC4, you could get root by interrupting the boot process, but that was passed a while ago and it's fixed in the 2U01, so we had to find our own way in. On the newer model, we found that we could abort the boot process using the magic sysrec key, which drops you to a prompt where you can lock in, log in as root. Because we're interrupting the boot process before the device is fully functional, we then had to manually run some startup scripts. Once at the proper run level, the device will start custom UbiCell binaries and connect the device to the carrier's network. As we mentioned, these techniques will no longer get you root on a patched device, but they're pretty handy tricks and they might be useful when testing other embedded devices. So now that we established a presence on a mini cell tower, let's poke around and see what we can see. The 2U01 runs a customized version of MontaVista Linux 5, kernel version 2.6.18. It includes a very stripped down Linux system, a few device drivers, and proprietary software to control its operation as a base station. It also includes Authentic's QuickSec VPN client, which is packaged as a kernel module. And I'll get more into this later. So this is great. We're root, but it's a pretty bare bones Linux system and there's not too many helpful commands available. Uh, there's no text editor. If you start a long running command, you can't control C out of it. Stuff like that was just very annoying to work with. Said's a little unwieldy, but we can use it to edit SSHD config to allow interactive root login. And so we did that. And flushed IP tables, and that made things much easier to work with. So great, we can SSH in, but we still have to run the sed command every time we turn the thing on because the file system obviously is pulled fresh on every boot. So we figured we could edit and reflash the firmware, but we really didn't want to run the risk of creating a doorstop. So we continued looking around and eventually we noticed a persistent file system location. So things are getting a little more interesting. We found a persistent place to store files, but that doesn't necessarily give us persistent root access, right? So we just catted all the things and spent a lot of time in slash Etsy. And we finally came across a script that appears to control some kind of debug mode. And for the record, that's not our typo in that echo statement. We created a file named .ubrc, put it in the mount onan directory, and were rewarded with a typo in the boot output. It worked. So more importantly, this ubrc file gets executed on startup, and we can put our own commands in there, and they'll be executed by root every time the unit boots. So it's just incredible time saver. We use it to patch SSHD, flush IP tables and drop us into a root shell automatically. So the next hurdle has been overcome and we now have persistent root access. Let's go get some packets, right? Do some eavesdropping. Should be easy. We'll just run TCP dump on the tunnel interface and all we see are encrypted packets. IPsec everywhere. What the hell? 
So it turns out that QuickSec is implemented as a NetFilter kernel module. It steals the packets before they ever hit a regular network interface, does encryption, decryption, and sends the traffic so you can't see anything good using packet capture utilities like TCP dump. So it seems like our fun is over. So now what do we do? Luckily, it's all just engineering. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. That's a pretty accurate representation of how the programming went on this project. <laughs> So setting up the cross-compilation environment for this was a real pain in the neck, but that's why we have interns. Uh, <laughs> we were finally able to get the right version of the MontaVista Linux toolchain, and then we could compile our code uh, against that to make binaries and kernel modules that would run on the Femto cell. So we figured out that we needed to write our own kernel module and insert it in such a way that we would be able to copy the packets before they were encrypted going out, and after they were decrypted on the way in. It took a little bit of trial and error, but with that kernel module loaded, we can pass the packets out into user land for logging to a PCAP. So with that hurdle over, let's go after the fun stuff. So we've got plain text packets, but it's a mess. Wireshark doesn't really parse much that helps us. The ports shown are completely foreign. Uh, we can surmise that a phone call generates lots of small UDP packets, as any VoIP protocol will do, but who's talking to whom, where's the audio, what are we looking for? Well, you can tell Wireshark to interpret the data as RTP, which only gets you a small step closer. As you can see circled, the RTP payload type is in the dynamic range, and according to the spec, dynamic is code for do whatever you want and don't expect to interoperate. So we had to figure out what type of codec we were dealing with which we did by downloading every single RFC there is and grepping through them en masse, looking for codecs whose frame sizes matched the size of the packets we were seeing. And we eventually found one that we thought it might be, a codec called EVRC. Now EVRC is one of those random cellular codecs that no media player implements, so we couldn't just pop it into VLC. Uh, so what do you do when you can't figure something out and you've hit a dead end? You go to Stack Overflow. <laughs> But this had already been asked and received no answers. So here's the real secret of productive hackers. It's not asking questions on Stack Overflow. It's bountying questions on Stack Overflow. <laughs> so what we got was a link to the actual reference implementation of EVRC published by the 3G PP2 multi-carrier working group thing. And it took some Endian and byte fiddling, but after passing it through uh, this and socks like the Linux utility socks, we were able to actually get audio out of it. So we are going to attempt a live demo. What is your favorite cyber buzzword? Cyber. <laughs> Just cyber. So Doug is placing a call to the, from a phone that is associated to the femto cell. Which computer? Which computer? All right, so now we're going to pull the PCAP and hopefully play it. Boy, boy, I hope this works. So that was before the call was placed. Did you know that you were sending the audio? And there's it's ringing. And Hello? There's Andrew. Hey, Andrew, did you hear about Cyber Pompeii? That shit's blowing up. That's hilarious, Doug. So that is the live voice demo. And this was the slide with the backup. <laughs> so it took us a little while to figure out SMS as well, and we'll spare you the gory details this time. Uh, the text message itself is encoded in 7-bit blocks, so it's kind of a pain to decode, but we can get the data out. And we actually made a Wireshark dissector. We also made a Wireshark dissector. That's not nearly as interesting as trying for another demo. All right, so let's go for it.
So we've asked uh, some people to text a phone number that's associated with the femtocell, and hopefully they will be showing up. And there it is. <laughs> All right, so that is live SMS. <laughs> what, no ASCII art? <laughs> and that was the backup. <laughs> Alright, so we've got voice calls and SMS, but we live in the smartphone era. Let's see some data. Uh, thankfully, it's plain text. This was so much easier. Everything is parsed and displayed in Wireshark. There are more layers and tunnels encapsulating the data, but overall, it looks like pretty much any other land capture. So let's look at it. Uh, with passive interception, we can pick up your MMS because that's not sent over SSL. Did you know that? Uh, so let's switch over. And here is an MMS that we captured of you lovely folks. So we can view all the plain text. Passive interception is done and working. Let's do some active attacks. And the easiest thing to do with data is to drop it on the floor. Now there's a lot of debate about how iMessage works and just how secure it is, but what is certain is that it uses SSL to talk home to Apple. So we can't see those messages. But if you block the SSL connection back home to Apple, iMessage fails over to SMS, which is plain text, and that we can see just fine. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to the data. It's plain text, but it's encapsulated all up and down. If we're lucky, it's a fairly nice encapsulation that Wireshark handles for us. If we're unlucky, the normal IP, TCP, and HTTP that you're used to gets encoded and then split across GRE packets. And this is what an unlucky one looks like in Wireshark. In the lower right, you can see the HTTP. In the upper left, you see that there's just something called data. And if you can read it, the frames that are listed are just PPP fragments. That's the HTTP split across multiple GRE frames. So our goal is to edit a web page in the simplest way possible. <laughs> changing anything in HTTP means changing the TCP checksum, uh, and also means changing, because we're encapsulated in PPP and GRE, it means changing the PPP checksum. The PPP checksum is a couple of frames later, and we only get to see one packet at a time. And the frames might be out of order. So it's going to be a little tricky. The first thing we tried doing was doing it inline in the kernel. Really quickly, we figured out that the carrier has a transparent proxy on all of your web browsing on your phone. Let me repeat that. Verizon has a transparent proxy on all the web browsing on your phone. It's kind of creepy doing it without your knowledge, but frankly, we weren't really surprised. Uh, one of the things that they do with this proxy is applying HTTP compression to anything that doesn't already have it, which makes sense. It does actually speed things up. Uh, we didn't detect any SSL man in the middling or JavaScript injection, uh, and I don't think Verizon is alone or the only carrier who does this. But nonetheless, it's there, and from a technical standpoint, we had to work around it. We tried disabling it, but no dice. So we tried doing DNS hijacking. But the transparent proxy ignores the IP address you're trying to talk to and does their own lookup on the host header. So then we tried something crazy, and this got us pretty close. We did the DNS hijacking, and then in our kernel module, we rewrote the traffic from port 80 to port 81, so the carrier wouldn't proxy it. Our server listens on port 81 and responds back, and then on the inbound, the kernel module rewrites it back to port 80. And this worked most of the time. The problem was we'd hit a couple of corner cases and when it takes hundreds or thousands of packets to load a web page, corner cases add up. So what ended up working was doing all of that except the server listens on port 81 and redirects the browser to port 8080, which the carrier also doesn't proxy. So in the end, what ends up happening is you open a website, say CNN.com. We DNS hijack you. You try to talk to our server on port 80, but the femtocell kernel module rewrites your connection to port 81 to bypass the transparent proxy. We listen on 80 and respond, and the kernel rewrites it back to port 80 on the inbound. The response we send actually redirects you 
to CNN.com on port 8080, which you don't notice because mobile UI sucks. <laughs> and then you talk to our server, well, CNN.com, but really our server, on port 8080 directly, bypassing the proxy with no port rewriting. And at that point, we can man in the middle of the user pretty effectively. We strip off SSL, we pass along the cookies. Uh, it's a little bit slow, but cellular is a little bit slow. So rather than try and do a demo that you know might have us uh, you know waiting a little bit, we're just going to play the video. Here's hoping this goes. There we go. So in the lower right is the phone. We are typing in uh, a bank, Wells Fargo. In the lower left, you can see all of the resources and web pages that we are middling on our server. And then the, we have the over the, the shoulder shot showing what's going on. In the upper left is where the username and password will show up in just a moment. So we're going to click on sign in and we'll type in a username, uh, key by painful key. And then we'll type in a password. And we'll send it and there's the username and password in the upper left. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Doug. Thank you, Code Monkey. So this is all pretty cool, and we're really excited about it. But these things are mini cell towers. It's got to be possible to do more with them, right? So if there's anything cooler than intercepting and modifying phone calls and text messages, it's becoming the person holding the phone. For those of you familiar with GSM terms like IMEI or MC, CDMA has their own slightly different identifiers that serve the same purpose. The key difference is that SIM cards aren't typically used in US CDMA networks, so instead of an MC, the M MIN is just a 10 digit phone number. This is sometimes the same as your actual phone number, but not always because of porting numbers between carriers. This is a pretty important distinction because we discovered that most, but not all, of the communication between the handset and the carrier uses the ESN and MIN for identification. So that's why when we display active captures that show the MIN, Sometimes it's the exact same phone number and sometimes it's not, and unfortunately there's no obvious correlation. The MDN is your actual phone number, and it's not used for basic CDMA network authentication. Your phone just receives it during activation so it knows what its actual phone number is. The ESN is the analog of the IMEI. It was previously used as a unique number, but carriers ran out officially in 2010. ESNs have since been superseded by MEIDs. Pseudo ESNs are always prefixed with a zero. The remaining bytes are the 24 least significant bits of the SHA-1 hash of the handset's MEID. Pseudo ESNs are not guaranteed to be unique since the MEID is the unique identifier for those handsets that have one. Older model phones use the ESN to identify themselves to the network. Newer phones use the MEID but still re retain a pseudo ESN since it's required for compatibility reasons. So to clone a phone, all you have to do is grab somebody's phone, write down the ESN or MEID and their phone number, copy these numbers to another handset, and you get a valid clone, right? Well, years ago, this used to be all it took. Since the MIN was usually the same as the phone number, and the ESN was printed on any given device, it was trivial for an attacker to get these values and use someone else's expensive wireless minutes to make calls. So Qualcomm and the CDMA carriers had to come up with a solution. We won't get into a ton of detail, but the CAVE authentication mechanism makes it very difficult to successfully clone a CDMA phone. Additional keys are used in a challenge response protocol to authenticate the customer and the call. Manufacturers of CDMA devices are supposed to make these keys difficult to obtain so a full clone is not possible. All that being said, let's see if our rogue femto cell has any more secrets it wants to give up. As we mentioned earlier, the femto cell acts like a typical cell tower, except with at least one key difference. The femto cell only uses the ESN and MIN to authenticate handsets. We're not entirely sure why, we really have no idea, but it may suggest a legacy CDMA implementation. But the real problem here is that we discovered that the femto cell did not have CAVE enabled. It behaved like a legacy tower and just ignored those keys, relying solely on the ESN and MIN for authentication. Cloning becomes extremely easy, just like the good old days. Note that the clone phone will only work while connected to the femto cell, but it can be any femto cell, not necessarily one that's been modified. 
So we just need to somehow obtain the ESN and MIN of our victim and program those numbers into another handset. You're generally not supposed to be able to write the ESN, but some phone models do allow it. So it's just like the movies, right? We wait until our victim runs to the bathroom, we grab his phone, write down the ESN and MIN, and clone the phone, right? That's just so messy. We have to invite our victim out to eat. We have to wait till they go to the bathroom. We have to risk getting caught going through their phone. And what happens if they take their phone to the bathroom to play shit and spell, uh, words with friends? It's, it's just not worth it. <laughs> if only there was an easier way to defraud my friends. So remember that time I told you how we can see every packet that goes through the femto cell? Well, that includes handset registration packets, and these contain the ESN and MIN of the phone associated to the femto cell. So, all I have to do is capture packets on my rogue femto cell and wait for an unsuspecting mobile phone to come within range. When the phone associates to the femto cell, I catch the ESN and MIN without physical access to the phone and without any indication to the user. So, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? Here it is, step by step. Victim phone comes within range of a malicious femto cell. As the handset registers to the carrier network, the ESN and MIN are captured and written to a separate target handset. The target handset can then be used as a perfect clone of the victim as long as it's associated to a femto cell. It'd be possible to capture phones in New York City using a rogue femto cell and email the numbers to an accomplice in Seattle who is using a stock femto cell. It's almost the perfect crime. So while we were testing for cloning, we noticed our results were a little inconsistent. This probably wouldn't work too well if you were trying to use it as your personal cell phone. But if your aim was to make money through toll fraud, you could probably make enough money to buy a boat that has smaller boats inside of it. <laughs> we suspect our problems may have something to do with the relative signal strength of neighboring cell towers, as we saw slightly different results when testing in an urban environment versus a more rural one. But the short answer is we just don't know. So we tested cloning with voice, SMS, and data. Some of the results were expected and some were not. Probably the most interesting thing was the not quite three-way call. So I'm gonna describe a few scenarios in the next couple slides and the following definitions will be helpful. Our victim is the person with a shiny new iPhone and they're the phone that we want to clone. The target is this bad guy with his crappy old flip phone and that's been modified to act like a copy or clone of the victim phone. So the easiest scenario is if the victim's phone is turned off, jammed, or otherwise not connected to any towers. Everything works as expected. No issues with service. You've got an exact working copy of the victim's phone for all intents and purposes. So when both phones are associated to the same femto cell, we noticed a few different things. Of course, the cloned phone, the target, must be associated to the femto cell in order to work properly. It's only possible to place outgoing calls one at a time. No matter which phone initiates the outgoing call, any subsequent call placed will force that call to drop. It doesn't seem to matter which phone is which, the target of the victim, they'll both knock each other off. We didn't notice any issues or anything strange with outgoing text messages. And for incoming SMS, the usual behavior seemed to be that both phones will receive the incoming text message. With incoming calls, sometimes one of two behaviors was possible. The first is that only one of the two phones ranks. It could be the victim or the target, it doesn't matter. Other times, both phones will ring at the same time. The phone that picks up the call first usually wins, which means it gets to stay on the call. But the coolest part is that sometimes, if the two phones answered within a few seconds of each other, we got what we're calling a two and a half way call. What would happen is both the target and the victim phones would connect and each would be able to hear the inbound caller, but not each other. The eavesdropping scenario here is pretty clear. Bad guy clones a phone, the victim gets a call, the bad guy can pick it up, mute his mic, and hear everything said by the incoming caller. In our second scenario, the target is associated to the femto cell as required, but the victim is out and about connected to a real tower. The phone that gets the incoming phone call appears to depend on which phone has had more recent communication with the carrier network, like a call or a text message. We couldn't reproduce the two and a half way call because the two phones would never ring at the same time. SMS was pretty similar to the situation with incoming calls. We never got an SMS on both phones at the same time. Outgoing calls are a little more interesting. So let's say the target, the cloned phone, is on an active phone call. 
This call works fine until our unsuspecting victim places an outgoing call to another party. The bad guy's call gets dropped and the call of our innocent victim is allowed to carry through. However, if the victim is on a call and the target phone places an outgoing call, the call will connect allowing two independent phone calls. The implications here are pretty clear. Why use your own minutes when you can use someone else's to call 1-900 numbers and run up a huge bill? This is especially awesome if you're the one who owns the 1-900 number. So I said earlier we'd talk about cloning data and here we are. Uh, it appears to be significantly more difficult to establish a data connection on a clone um, than it is to clone voice and text services. Data services on Verizon's network are required for MMS, account management features, and internet connectivity, of course. Long story short, the carrier network requires more numerical identifiers for a data connection than for voice and SMS. We're not saying it's impossible, we'd never say that out loud to a group of this size, but it's just much more difficult and we didn't dig too deep into it. So we have a video of this, which I will hopefully play. So I am calling a phone number. I'm gonna demonstrate the two and a half way call. You see both phones are ringing. That's our victim on the left and our target, the clone, on the right. We're gonna speed it up because it's a little slow. You see both phones answer and connect reliably. And in a few seconds, I'm gonna do some very sophisticated voice testing. Hello? Hello? And there you have it, folks. That's, a, that's what a phone tester does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we mentioned this at the beginning, but this issue has been resolved by Verizon and it was done on the back end many months ago. Uh, and this is great. Uh, it's the right thing to do. Authentication should be checked on the internal network that the carriers control, not on the small box that they don't. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tom. So it'd be easy to think that this is all about Verizon, but this is really about everybody. Uh, there are over 30 carriers worldwide who have femtocells and three of the four major US carriers. And clearly there are issues here, so what's a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation to do? Well, you can of course harden the actual device, but as we all know, there's nothing you're going to be able to do on the platform to prevent people with physical access from breaking in. Root is always possible. We didn't have to do more sophisticated attacks, but you sh obviously shouldn't rule them out. There are lots of ways to break onto an embedded device, and frankly, we went in through the front door. So what else can a vendor do? Well, you could force registration. Make the femtocell owner list the phones allowed to connect through their femtocell, and then confirm with the phone owner that they're cool with allowing that. If they try connecting through any other femtocell, don't let them. And do this whitelisting inside of the carrier network, of course, not on the device. This would make it much harder to take one of these down to Times Square or Las Vegas and just gobble up everyone who's around them. Device registration definitely reduces the attack surface. And here's a breakdown of the major US cell carriers and how they handle handset registration on their femtocells, or at least according to the documentation. Besides T-Mobile, who doesn't have a femtocell, AT&T is leading in this category because they require registration. The other carriers, Sprint and Verizon, do not. So although phone registration does prevent the easiest attack, it doesn't win us over. It doesn't prevent attacks where I isolate you from the carrier network. You'll still see four bars, send beacons with your MIN and ESN, try to make phone calls, and send us text messages, and even though I never deliver any of that up to the carrier network, I'll still see them. I can track you and read your SMS, and we've verified this experimentally. It's actually what we're doing right now. Uh, we isolate any phone who's not whitelisted because we don't want to receive inbound text messages or data sessions. With a little more engineering, it'd be possible to connect those phones to our phone line, spoof SMSs to them, uh, and even route the data out the femtocell through another internet connection to let them browse the internet, all without connecting them to the carrier network, so the carrier would never know that they're on a femtocell. So device registration, where the phone opts into using a femtocell, and the femtocell opts into having the phone, 
is a good minimum level of security, but we don't think it's enough. Really what you should be doing is ditching them altogether. Uh, you guys know that there will be bugs in everything, but that said, we like Wi-Fi calling. If the handset is on Wi-Fi, not even your own Wi-Fi, but untrusted Wi-Fi, and it IPsecs or SSL tunnels into the carrier network, doing certificate pinning, and the phone is appropriately distrusted from a network perspective, so you can't just go end mapping all their crap, uh, we think you get a much stronger architecture. And you have to do the same type of cell phone authentication you do with the tower, but that's no weaker than what we have now. And what you get is not needing femtocells, which is a win, uh, being able to make calls on your or any random Wi-Fi, which is a win, and those calls are encrypted against the Wi-Fi operator, which is a win. And going even further, you can build in end-to-end -end encryption to protect the contents of the call against both untrusted Wi-Fi operators and the carrier. And there are individual apps to do this, but they all require the recipient to have the same app. If Google and Apple and BlackBerry built this into their phones and carriers supported this model, we think there'd be a pretty big increase in adoption. So I was just talking about this, but let's sum up and present a couple of other band-aids that you can try. Hardening the femtocells is due diligence, but ultimately it's a losing proposition. You have to do more. Requiring registration prevents untargeted attacks, but only to some degree. Long term, we're just pretty nervous about giving random people, like yourselves, cell phone towers and just hoping you don't break into them. Now, can you tell if you're connected to a femtocell? In the beginning, we said no, but it had an asterisk. We noticed that some Android phones have an icon indicating they are connected to a femtocell. It looks like a little house. And this was only in phones that Verizon had modified. It's not in the Android source or in any stock or flash ROMs iPhone has no visual indicator at all. Uh, there's a short beep at the beginning of phone calls, but it's really easy to miss and it only if you make a phone call. And somehow, but, but somehow, these Android phones were detecting femtocells and showing an icon. So we reverse engineered that and we're halfway done with our own app, the Femto Catcher. So we noticed that the network ID indicates if it's a femtocell. And it's possible to lie about that. We didn't look into how hard it would be. But using this, we can still write a tool that will put a phone into airplane mode when it detects itself being connected to a femtocell. Now to be clear, we're not marketing this widely or to your extended family. We're building this because we want it. We would rather not have service than be connected to one of these, especially at Black Hat. <laughs> and we're going to be sharing it with you folks because we thought that you might want that option as well. It's going to be available uh, soon. We have a few kinks to work out in it. Uh, and we really have to thank uh, Mira Thamboretti for basically doing all the work on this. <laughs> so what else can you do proactively? Well, of course, you can encrypt what you do on your phone, and there are a multitude of free and paid apps to do so if you can convince your communication partner to use the same app. So what else can you do if you root this or another femtocell and you're operating a small cell tower? What would we like to see, you know, in the future? Well, there's WAP. WAP is basically web browsing for flip phones. It uses custom protocols, it's heavily proxied, uh, it does SSL man in the middling, whether they tell you that or not. Uh, but we still think it's a valuable re research target. Now you might think WAP is dead, but it's actually used by a couple billion people in the developing world, and smartphone manufacturers and carriers are still developing and investigating in it, or investing in it. And of course, there's that binary blob that has complete control over your entire phone that nobody's been able to inspect in any straightforward way, at least not that we can get the results of. You could definitely fuzz the baseband with a femtocell. And it'd probably let you get a little bit deeper into any carrier-specific stuff that they're doing than just using a general software-defined radio. And since the device makes a VPN into the carrier network, you can poke around inside of their network. You can look at attacking other femtocells from your, fem from your femtocell, or look at attacking the carrier's infrastructure itself. And the talk from two years ago did this with fantastic results. That was uh, Ravi, Nico, and Kevin. And they were able to wiretap not just their femtocell, but every femtocell that was on that French carrier. That's a little bit farther than we wanted to go without permission from the carrier. But if you happen to be a carrier and you're cool with us doing that, we'd love to do it in our free time. 
So we worked hard to wrap up a little bit early, hopefully, because we wanted to leave time for questions. But before questions, we have to thank a lot of people. Um, Andrew, uh, who, Andrew, who was one of the interns who initially had to set up that tool chain for us, uh, Davis and Tim, who helped us when we got stuck a couple of times, uh, Mira, Michael, Peter, Joel, Joel stomach lining, and uh, really everybody at ISEC for putting up with this research over the past year and especially the last few weeks. And uh, last but not least, our external and internal legal counsels. <laughs> so I have no idea if this is going to work, but we are going to try and do another live demo. And if you would all like to text that number up there, we will hopefully show your text on the bottom part of the screen. And I have no idea what will happen when an entire room of people all text a phone en masse. So we'll find out. And while we do that, let's take some questions if there are any. Uh, there are mics in the. Uh, is this a trick to box everyone's phone number? Is this a trick to harvest everyone's no phone no number? No comment. No comment. No comment. Uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I Yes, so in the first demo, we were listening to the mic on the phone before the phone call connected. You are sending your audio while it's ringing into the carrier's network. Even a little bit before it's ringing is our experience. Once you hit send. Pretty much once you hit send, yeah. Any other questions? Did we try any other manufacturer of the femtozels? Uh, we did not create a proof of concept on any other manufacturer, and the brief testing that we did on the Sprint femtozel was really just to confirm if we could get root the same way. Um, it is likely possible, um, but we didn't try it for lack of time. Does the femto catcher catch only illicit femto cells or all femto cells? The way it's written, it will catch all femto cells because there's, I mean, the femto cell isn't going to tell you, hey, I'm hacked. <laughs> um, and like we said, it's possible to lie about the network ID. We don't know how difficult that is. Uh, so this is about the FCC. How concerned are we that they might come after us because we are operating? I mean, these devices are, are sold and they're meant to be put in your house and they're apparently allowed by the FCC. So we were relatively comfortable with that and so were our lawyers. Okay, so you're saying they're low enough power so that they fall underneath the guidelines. So maybe unplug that antenna. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, it's. <laughs> How effective are the patches? How effective are the patches? Any other questions? <laughs> How widespread is the patch? So the patch is pushed down to all the units that are, you know, on. Uh, it's like automatic. It's not something you install, obviously. It's basically pushed down over the wire. Automatically. Automatically. Uh, we're, if, if the question was if it's already been hacked, would the patch stop you? I mean, you have complete control over the device, right? So it's engineering. Uh, he asked if the patches are cryptographically signed so you could push, potentially push patches to other femto cells. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, excellent question. How much time did we put into this research? We had been working on it for about the last year, uh, partially on sponsored research time, uh, a good amount on our free time. You know, I've lost track of the number of hours, but it's not trivial, but it was still easier than we'd have liked it to be. You 
Uh, the question was, do we know if the uh, encryption from the femtocell to the carrier is similar or the same as the regular tower into the carrier? And the answer is, I have no idea. Sorry. Okay, I don't see any other questions. We are, we have to pack up a whole bunch of stuff, but we want to, okay, a couple more. <laughs> Uh, the question was, are you able to basically poke around on the phone like activating the send button? Um, I mean, that's the type of exploitation on the phone that we didn't really try to do. That's kind of like fuzzing the baseband, stuff like that. So maybe, but we didn't really try. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>